Okay, so I'm doing the hello triangle. Right now we're on the vertex shader. Uh, for some reason, the video doesn't seem to have gone well, so um, got cut or something. But okay, seems like everything's fine now. having to read this because it's actually got code now. Let's see here. This the vertex here. shader is one of the shaders that are programmable by people like us. Modern OpenGL requires that we at least set up a vertex and fragment shader if we want to do some rendering so we will briefly introduce shaders and configure two very simple shaders for drawing our first triangle. In the next chapter we'll discuss shaders in more detail. The first thing we need to do is write the vertex shader in the shader language GLSL, OpenGL shading language, and then compile this shader so we can use it in our application. Below, you'll find the source code of a very basic vertex shader in GLSL. As you can see, GLSL looks similar to C. Each shader begins with a declaration of its version. Since OpenGL 3.3 and higher, the version numbers of GLSL match the version of OpenGL, GLSL version 420 corresponds to OpenGL version 4.2 for example. We also explicitly mention we're using core profile functionality. Next, we declare all the input vertex attributes in the vertex shader with the in keyword. Right now, we only care about position data, so we only need a single vertex attribute. GLSL has a vector data type that can... Next, we declare all the input vertex attributes in the... Ver Since OpenGL 3.3 and higher, the version numbers of GLSL match the version of OpenGL. GLSL version 420 corresponds to OpenGL version 4.2, for example. We also explicitly mention we're using core profile functionality. Next, we declare all the input vertex attributes in the vertex shader with the in keyword. Right now, we only care about position data, so we only need a single vertex attribute. GLSL has a vector data type that contains one to four floats based on its postfix digit. Since each vertex has a three Vector in graphics programming, we use the mathematical concept of a vector quite often, since it neatly represents positions directions in any space and has useful mathematical properties. A vector in GLSL has a maximum size of 4, and each of its values can be retrieved via vec.x, vec.y, vec. Z and vec.w respectively where each of them represents a coordinate in space. Note that the vec.w component is not used as a position in space, we're dealing with 3D, not 4D, but is used for something called perspective division. We'll discuss vectors in much greater depth in a later chapter. To set the output of the vertex shader, we have to assign... Division. To set the output of the vertex shader, we have to assign the position data to the predefined GL position variable, which is a vec for behind the scenes. At the end of the main function, whatever we set GL position to will be used as the output of the vertex shader. Since our input is a vector of size 3, we have to cast this to a vector of size 4. We can do this by inserting the vec3 values inside the constructor of vec4 and set its w component to 1.0f, we will explain why in a later chapter. 
The current vertex shader is probably the most simple vertex shader we can imagine because we did no processing whatsoever on the input data and simply forwarded it to the shader's output. In real applications, the input data is usually not our to set the output of the vertex shader, we have to assign the position data to the predefined GL position variable, which is a VEC for behind the scenes. At the end of the main function, whatever we set GL position to will be used as the output of the vertex shader. Since our input is a vector of size 3, we have to cast this to a vector of size 4. We can do this by inserting the VEC3 values inside the constructor of VEC4 and set its W component to 1.0F, we will explain why in a later chapter. The current vertex shader is probably the most simple vertex shader we can imagine because we did no processing whatsoever on the input data and simply forwarded it to the shader's output. In real applications, the input data is usually not already in normalized device coordinates so we first have to transform the input data to coordinates that the current vertex shader is probably the most simple vertex shader we can imagine because we did no processing whatsoever on the input data and simply forwarded it to the shader's output. In real applications, the input data is usually not already in normalized device coordinates so we first have to transform the input data to coordinates that fall within OpenGL's visible region. 5.3 Compiling a shader We take the source code for the vertex shader and store it in a const C string at the top of the code file for now. Const char vertex shader source equals <coughs> hashtag version 330 In order for OpenGL to use the shader it has to dynamically compile it at runtime from its source code. The first thing we need to do is create a shader object, again referenced by an ID. So we store the vertex shader as an unsigned int and create the shader with glCreateShader. Unsigned int vertex shader, vertex shader equals glCreateShader, gl vertex shader. We provide the type of shader we want to create as an argument to glCreateShader. Since we're creating a vertex shader, we pass in gl vertex shader. Next, we attach the shader source code to the shader object and compile the shader. GL shader source, vertex shader, 1, and vertex shader source, null, GL compile shader. GL shader source, vert. So. They're not really explaining super well. The shader is for, but I'm assuming that if I just keep going, I'll understand it. Like the specifics. It seems kind of like, why don't you just do it all in C? Um, or why is this location thing? Here, why does that matter? Why don't they just assume location by its position? GL shader source, vertex shader, 1, and vertex shader source, null, GL compile shader, vertex shader. The GL shader source function takes the shader object to compile to as its first argument. The second argument specifies how many strings we're passing as source code, which is only one. The third parameter is the actual source code of the vertex shader, and we can leave the fourth parameter to null. You probably want to check if compilation was successful after the call to GL compile shader, and if not, what errors were found so you can fix those. Checking for compile time errors is accomplished as follows. In success, char info log, GL get shader of, vertex shader, GL compile status, and success. First, we define... First, we define an integer to indicate success and a storage container. First, we define an integer to indicate success and a storage container for the error messages, if any. Then we check if compilation was successful with GL get shader of. If compilation failed, we should retrieve the error message with glgetShader info log and print the error message. If success, glgetShader info log, vertex shader, 512, null, info log, std, coot error, shader, vertex, compilation failed, n, info log, std, and l. If no errors were detected while compiling the vertex shader, it is now compiled. 5.4 Fragment Shader The frag- Okay, so I'm going to pause right here. And then we'll get started on the fragment shader, which 
looks like it's quite a bit. Not, not that much, but some of this can be intense. You have to like stop and read 